Hi everyone, uh, my name's Nick Hopwood. This is the second of a series of videos uh, that aims to help you think through some key things in qualitative data analysis. Uh, the first one was about the history, the messy history of coming to work with the concept and get to know it. And I talked about initial contact, developing understanding, recognition, boundary work, and then applying the concept as a tool and it works back on you. And then you kind of end up with this sort of sensibility in using a concept. Uh, this second video it kind of shifts a bit sideways from that. It's still in the kind of idea of setting up some ground rules or basic understandings which inform some of the later videos that will come up in this series. And this one is really about trying to figure out what it is you're trying to do when you're doing qualitative data analysis. Um, and it's a kind of at a general and quite fundamental level, but this has lots of important concrete and practical implications. Um, what I'm going to do as before is switch over to a few slides, talk through those, and then come back. So bear with me just whilst I change my screen setup. Okay. So here we can see what are you trying to achieve in qualitative data analysis? And I'll, I'll talk through three different scenarios. Each one will come up on a column on this table. Uh, the three are somewhat artificial, but they're sort of they're scarecrows, if you like, that I'm setting up. The point is not that there's kind of, they're really these hard categories, but to provoke the kind of thinking into which sort of analysis you're leaning towards. One view in analysis is that you're trying to come up with a the analysis, or the interpretation. And here it specifies there is only one. If you have a particular question and a particular set of data, there is one proper or right analysis. And this has the quality that it's kind of researcher proof. You would, well, by that I mean that the same analytical outcome would be reached regardless of which researchers were doing it. And you can see symptoms or signs of this um, in studies where people might, for example, want to talk about intercoder reliability and validity. And the reliability thing is the saying that the same coder would do the same kind of work. And the validity is that it's kind of for the same reasons that they're doing the same kind of conceptual work together to come up with that outcome. The idea of this analysis finding the qualitative analysis is that it's objective. Again, that's another word that strikes at this idea of being researcher proof. The person doing the analysis doesn't have so much of a role. The analysis is really secured in the data in itself. And really, this extends to the idea that in this analysis, what you're doing is you're discovering something which is already there. Now, you can go a little bit further from that. So it might be that two researchers both have the same theoretical understanding and can therefore discover the same thing and reach the same outcome, which is researcher proof. Or they have a code book or something that's been developed, so it tells them the rules that are there. So it may not be exclusively discovery of what's 100% there. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's very much kind of an emerging property from the data itself. Then on the other side of this table, you'll see now what I've brought up is the idea of any analysis. And you could say, well, no, I'm not looking for the analysis. I'm looking for the kind of that's not how it fits or makes sense for me. And in any analysis, there could be infinite possible outcomes of applying a particular question to a particular set of data. It doesn't mean that you can necessarily say anything, like you couldn't say something that was obviously disproved or discounted or challenged in your data, but there is kind of a boundless set of directions in which you could go, different theories you could layer on, different things you could focus on. In a sense, this is also researcher proof because um, it does, who does the analysis does change the outcome, but this doesn't matter. So the kind of the objective version, the analysis is researcher proof because different people got the same outcome. Here it's researcher proof because it still doesn't matter which person gets it, does it? Although the outcome is different, but we still value that outcome. Um, rather than being objective, this approach is very subjective. And in its extreme version, all outcomes are equally valid or valuable, presuming that they have some kind of connection with the data. And what we might have here is a scenario of kind of very open-ended creation without boundaries. Now, it doesn't mean it's com kind of completely open. As I said before, you can't do something, you couldn't go and analyse something that was completely contrary to your data. But there are very few limits set on what you can do. As I said before, these are slightly artificial scenarios here at either ext extreme. 
Um, but certainly there are kind of some views that might be going towards this. Now what I'm going to suggest is that for many people, and most of the research I've done, in fact all of it I think, is really looking for an analysis, which sits between the analysis and any. It certainly suggests that there is more than one possible right or valid or useful outcome that we could get from analysis, but not infinite numbers. This is not research approved. It does matter who does this. It's not research approved in the, the analysis sense because two, out, two researchers do the same thing, and it's not research approved in the any sense in that it doesn't matter which researcher does it because the outcome is all equally valid. I think in this an approach, it is researcher dependent. The researcher is re recognised as a strength. We have reflexivity. We do our we kind of approach our analysis in a situated way. And what we can bring to the analysis, our sensibilities, our theoretical understandings, all that stuff I talked about in video one about the way we come to know a concept and the particular concepts we bring to bear, can add to the analysis, as well as our personal values and histories and, and knowledge. And I'll come back to that in a minute. This is subjective still. It's certainly not objective, but it's we have caveats or warrants as to why this analysis is better than any others. Now, in any analysis, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. You'd have to just kind of establish that it has some connection to your evidence or your data, but you wouldn't necessarily be arguing why this is better. I don't really think that right-hand column uh, or the any analysis kind of exists so much in research, but it's kind of tendencies towards that. This more central idea, you have to be very clear why this particular analysis is being advanced over other possible ones. We're not discovering here in an analysis. We are creating we're creating new knowledge and new understandings. But we can bring all relevant information to bear. That could be other data. It could be theory. It could be prior studies. It could be if we're researching something which we're very familiar. Years of professional experience in a field which helps us understand something, understand the significance of something or its consequences. Um, so an analysis will bring all relevant information to bear, and this has implications for why we might encounter some very serious limitations as to how useful coding might be for us as an analytical approach. It may be useful as an early step, but we'll certainly have to go beyond this in terms of bringing other information to bear. So an analysis is bounded by filling a particular gap in knowledge and answering your research questions. And it also, I might add if I had more text space on the slide. It's an analysis that really builds a picture about justification, warrants, why this is better, why this is a better answer to your question, why this approach has advantages over other approaches, and that's to do with convincing your readers and examiners. So there we have it, the three different versions. Now as I said, these are not really kind of neat boxes into which research fits. I think it's quite likely you might find some examples of qualitative analysis more towards the, the analysis approach, trying to be objective um, and integrated reliability and things like that might be there. I don't think there will be many in that very far extreme of kind of any analysis goes, but certainly between that middle column and both edges there are a whole range of approaches to analysis. I would advocate, personally from my experience, that I think the most rewarding one is looking for an analysis. That my contribution matters, that the analysis I do is different from the analysis that somebody else would do. But my analysis, somebody else could do a good one, it's up to me to argue why my analysis is better. Why my instincts, my interpretations are justifiable, trustworthy, and draw on everything that I have to bear, that it can help me to make sense of something and answer the research questions I have and fill in the gap in a useful or meaningful or high value add way. Uh, now, I have done another video um, and you'll see on the blog the reference to it, um, looking at an article by Shenton about trustworthiness in qualitative research and that might be part of how you develop warrants for this analysis being advanced over and above any others. So in an analysis, you're not the only answer, you don't have to try and find the only answer, you're not discovering, you are putting forward a created case based on a number of kind of warrants, not only about the support from the data, but why this analysis might hold or be presented in, in, over and above any others. I will come back to these ideas and they will provide a framework for some of the later videos where we talk about things like coding, whether you have to include all your data for analysis, 
um, working with theory, uh, 10 ways to be wrong, interpreting qualitative data, and some general characteristics of what I think good analysis processes might look and feel like. I hope this has been useful. Take care. Bye-bye.